We are in Revelation chapter 2. If you'll turn there, we'll pray. How many of you guys have read ahead? Oh, man, we're breaking records. <laughs> 19. <laughs> Look, it's easy now. We'll be going through these seven letters to the seven churches. And it's, it's like eight verses a church. If you, if you have trouble, we'll put you on the intercessory prayer list. And someday, each day, somebody will remind you to read the next verse if you can finagle some time. Um, Father, we thank you for this time that we're gathering. Thank you for the live stream folks that are watching at home. Lord, uh, speak to our hearts today. Lord, this second service, would you speak to me? Lord, looking into this letter to our church, to me. Lord, to the churches across the country, to you, our families and our kids to Calvary Philly. Lord, give us our portion, Lord. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We're so thankful for the hope you have set on the horizon of our hearts, Lord, that blessed hope in the days that we're living in. Lord, we don't want to see anyone lost, Lord. We can't imagine an eternity in outer darkness without you. So. Lord Jesus, please let us be contagious in these days, Lord. One person saved is an eternity that's changed. Make us wise, Lord. Let us walk in the power of your spirit. We are 100% dependent upon you, Lord. And we, we are greatly consoled by the fact we can do that. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, we begin the letters to the seven churches. John, uh, laying on his face before the Lord, fell down before the Lord. And uh, the Lord then told him to get up. And John is writing as Jesus is dictating. So this letter differs, in a sense, from the other books of the Bible. Because in those books, the writer was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write John actually has Jesus standing right in front of him, and he's the secretary, and he's writing down the words right from Jesus Christ. As we move into these letters to the seven churches, certainly seven historical churches in Asia Minor that John would have been familiar with. Um, but certainly written to the church today, and probably more importantly this morning, written to each one of us as individuals, important to me, important to each of us as sons and daughters. Because at the end of each letter, it says, let him who has an ear, that's singular, let him or her, the individual, who has an ear, anybody have an ear? About nine of us, anybody have two ears? <laughs> All right, you're, you're, you're twice as accountable. You know, anybody who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit, it's in the present tense, is saying today. Unto the churches, plural, not just Ephesus. So anybody who is studying through this letter to the church of Ephesus, first of all, there's a blessing for those who read and those who hear and then those who guard these things. And I want you to guard the things that you hear today. And it says that we should hear these things as individuals. What the Jesus is saying today, not just to Ephesus then, but to the church as plural. Now, each letter begins with the Lord introducing himself with part of his description from chapter one. Here as he writes to this church at Ephesus, he's the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And, uh, and walks in the middle of the seven lampstands. Each church gets a part of his description relative to uh, their advantages and disadvantages. Um, each letter to the churches start with this, I know thy works, all seven times. That's the way he starts. So when he speaks to the churches, uh, there is an introduction from his person, his, his abilities, his sovereignty. Uh, there is a commendation. I see what you're doing. 
Then there is a correction or a reproof. Then there is a prescription, how that's to be, you know, corrected. And then there's a promise. And they kind of all fall, you know, there's two, I think, where the promise is before the correction. But they kind of all follow the same pattern. Um, Ephesus is the only one of the seven churches that's mentioned in the book of Acts. And Ephesus is the only church that receives a letter, only, only church in the New Testament that receives a letter from two apostles. 30 to 35 years before this, Paul had written the letter to the Ephesians. And now it's 35 years later, and Jesus is writing this letter through John to Ephesus. We are 60 years after Pentecost, two generations. So it's important to see what Jesus is saying to the church two generations later. It's important to me what he's saying to you and I this morning because we're 30 some years after we began. Ephesus means the desired one. And this is the most notable city in Asia Meyer. Ephesus has a population of 500,000 people. Ephesus has a library with 200,000 volumes in it, and they're all written by hand. Ephesus is the banking center of the world. The, the, the temple to Diana is where merchants from all over the Mediterranean world and Rome did their banking. It was three times the size of the Parthenon, the temple to Diana. <clears throat> it was one of the seven wonders of the world. But it was also filled with over a thousand temple prostitutes who went out and fared their trade in the, in the city. And if you had sex with a temple prostitute, that was a way of worshiping Diana. They were considered priestesses. So the, the crazy environment that this Ephesian church is in is relative to all of that too. There's immorality, there's money, uh, they had the Ionian games there. They were all Eagles fans. You know, th this is the environment that we live in in many, many, many ways going on uh, at the same time there. And, uh, and Jesus is speaking now to this church at Ephesus. Um, he begins by speaking to, let's just look at it. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, to me, the angels of the seven churches which are held in his right hand, some want to say that's an angel. I understand what they're saying. Angelos, angel is a transliteration. Angelos is a messenger. Seven times in the New Testament, it's translated messenger. John the Baptist, behold, I send my messenger, my angelos, before thy face. So these, to me at least, my own distorted opinion, these are humans. Uh, angels don't need mail from John. Uh, you, you'd have to, you know, I don't know what kind of postage you have to pay to get a letter that far. You know. And secondly, there's a rebuke here, and twice they're told to repent. That Only fallen angels would be told to repent, but there was no repentance for them. The angels fell, and they were lost forever, so there's no repentance for angels. So I believe these are the representatives of the church. Now, I'm selfish about that because it, it's just me and my world. And of course, that takes precedent over all of your worlds that, you know, uh, but, you know, it feels wonderful to think that I'm in his hand. You know, uh, I know you appreciate that, too, but I appreciate it in a letter here to the seven angels. It says, um, and, and look, interesting for John, because Paul Acts 18 and 19 tell us about the ministry in Ephesus over 30 years before this. And Paul had come there and labored for two years. Remember the school of Tyrannus? And he taught there for two years. And the word of God spread to these other churches that were born. Paul leaves and then Timothy comes to be the elder at Ephesus and work with these other churches. And he then finally is killed, beaten to death in the streets of Ephesus. And then around 66 AD, John the Apostle comes, and for 30 years, he's been the angel to the church of Ephesus. So it must be really interesting to hear John 
The Lord's saying, write this to the angel of the church. Really? You know, you've left your first love. John must be heartbroken to hear that about this church because in his, in his gospel, he says, you know, I was the disciple who Jesus loved. You know, he describes himself leaning on the Lord's breast. And now he's hearing the problem with this church is they've left off somewhere that they should never have left off. We're going to see all of the great things they're doing. By every human observation, this would be a church that you want to be involved in. You know, they have three services on Sunday morning, prayer on Sunday night. Uh, Monday nights, they have addictions meeting. They have young adults. They have over 50s. You know, uh, they have new believers. They have a Tuesday morning study. They have a Wednesday night study. They have studies for different groups. They have home fellowships. Uh, they do outreaches. They do harvest crusades. You know, they have youth ministry, junior high, senior high. You know, they've got all kinds of things going on. You look at that church and say, man, this church is doing it. There's missionaries, a lean, mean preaching machine. Look at this. this. This is the way it's supposed to be. Only Jesus says all of that is great. But there's something here that's breaking my heart because if it doesn't get corrected, all the rest of it will wither. Really interesting. And I wonder what it's like for John to hear that spoken to the church he's pastored for 30 years. Now, it's encouraging to me if John couldn't keep the church hot, you know, I ain't going to be me, you know. But uh, he, he is here now before the Lord. The Lord speaks to the angel of this church, and he says, These things saith he that holdeth, and, and the word is holdeth tightly, it kind of evolves, that holdeth tightly the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh, is presently walking, presently holding, presently walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So the churches, we're told the seven lampstands are the seven churches, not candlesticks. Candles are self-consuming. Lampstands are fueled by oil. The church needs to be fueled by the Holy Ghost. So here he is today walking in the midst of the church. Hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. He's still holds men and women that serve him in his hand and cares for them. He says, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say that they're apostles, and you have found them to be liars. So he begins by saying this, I know. It's all Aedis. It's a supernatural knowledge. It's a perfect tense, which means I've known and I continue to know. That's important to us because the same is true here this morning. And he says, I know your works. He says it to all seven. He commends each of these churches. You have things going on. I know your works. And Jesus is always looking for workers. He's not looking for loads. He's not looking for pubitatus. He's looking for workers. You know, he called Gideon when he was threshing grain. He called David when he was taking care of the flocks. He called the fishermen while they were mending nets. He, he's looking for workers. He's looking for people. There's work to do, isn't there? Christ is coming. There's a lot of unsaved people around us. There's work to do. He says, I know your works. I know it, Oedis. I know it completely. I see it. I know you're working. This church is doing things. He says, and your labor... There's a labor to work. Work is not Whistle and Dixie. If you're working, there's a labor involved in it. There's a cost. And your patience, which means it's patience under pressure. It's not just patience. And I know your patience. And he said, and I know this, how you cannot bear them which are evil. So this is a, a, a self-sustaining church. This church has works, it has labor, there's patience, there's good things to see. And it's a church who doesn't tolerate those who are evil. Kakos are just evil. Look, that's important because there's a lot of different parts of the church that say, ah, you're doing this, you're, that's fine, you're welcome here, no problem, you can live that way, you can live this way, that's cool, you can do it. No, Jesus said, no, this church is healthy because it has an immune system. This church is healthy because it's watching for defilement. Paul, 
Acts chapter 20, when he leaves the elders of Ephesus, they come to Miletus and they meet him there on the beach. And he says, look, I, I cease not to warn you by a period of two or three years because I know after my departure, grievous wolves are gonna come in from the outside and men are gonna rise out of your own midst, drawing disciples after themselves instead of after the Lord Jesus. And now it's 30 some years later. And this church has taken heed to some of those things Paul said because they can't bear those that are evil. Look, you and I have to be thoughtful about that and what it means. Because we live in a culture where the governor of the state can say it's legal for a 24-year-old to have sex with a 14-year-old, but it's not legal for somebody to preach the gospel in that state. It's legal for that to go on, and it isn't legal for the church to meet and worship and pray for the government. Isaiah said the days would come when right would be called wrong, wrong would be called right, good would be called evil, evil would be called good. Turn on the news. And the thing you and I have to be unintimidated about, here's our standard here. The news doesn't tell us what's right and wrong. God Almighty tells us what's right and wrong. And he said, I, I love this church because they know the difference. There are certain things right, certain things are wrong. He said, he said, I see that. He doesn't say here, I love you because you're Pharisees and you throw out everybody in your church that makes a mistake. That's not what it says. We have to love one another, restore one another. You know, the New Testament teaches you restore the sinner, you put out the person that causes division, and you, and you straighten out your own personal relationships. Gail Irwin used to say the problem with the church is we put out the sinner, we restore the person that causes division because they got all this God talk going on, and we never straighten out our personal differences. Restore the sinner. You know, the sinner is welcome to come and to repent, but he's saying there are those that are basically evil. They're evil, are they tares? We don't know. But you've put out those that are evil, those that are, you know, sowing discord, those that are damaging to the body of Christ, not someone who's struggling in their own life. And he said, and you have tried those who say that they are apostles and are not, you found them to be liars. Well, the way you do that is with the word of God. Paul said the Bereans were more noble because after he preached there, they went home and searched the scripture to see if the things he was saying were true. Paul said, don't believe anything I say, go look in the Bible. So he says here, of this Ephesian church. He says, and one of the great things about, you know, this is my bride, this is the desired one, this is a church I care for. If you've, you've tried those who claim to be apostles, you put them on trial and you have identified them that they're not, they're liars, they're liars. Because they would come into the church, the church was still fairly young into the first century and people were claiming to be apostles. Look, there's no apostles around today like there was then. Okay, there were, there were the A apostles. There's B apostles and C apostles. There's no more A apostles. Because they had been eyewitness of Jesus Christ. They had seen miracles. They had miracles in their own ministry. They had authority to write scripture. And their names are in the 12 foundation stones in the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Ain't none of them around today. God has used men and women powerfully over the years Apostolic in the sense that they've been sent forth to do things that affected the church and all that's wonderful. But there were those coming around claiming to be A apostles who were really Z apostles. He said, you've tried them. You found them to be liars. That's what they are. I appreciate that. Look at verse three and he says, and you have borne. That means to bear a heavy load. They couldn't bear those that were evil, and he says, you have borne, so there's the right patience and the right impatience, he sees in this church. You have borne, and you, you've been patient, hupomone again, under pressure. No, look what he says, and for my name's sake, you have labored, and it's labored to the point of exhaustion, and it's the perfect tense, and you still labor that way. and you've not fainted. Look, the amazing thing, he says, you've done that for me. You've done that for my name's sake. You know, I, I look at you, I know your works, I, I know your labor, I know your patience. I, I know you, you know, can't stand those that are evil. You, you've 
kept the church pure. I, I, I understand you tried those who said they're apostles and they're not. There's, there's good church discipline going on. I, I, I see that you've labored to the point of exhaustion and you continue to do that. And you do these things for my name's sake. And anybody looking at this church from the out, outside would say, wow, I want to go there. But Jesus, as the great physician, can say this. There's a problem that is not visible to the eye. There's an atrophy because your love is growing cold. There's a nevertheless. Nevertheless. He says, there's this one thing. You know, I'd be happy if he said to, my, to me, Joe, in your life, there's this one thing. Wow. We're getting it down now. Instead of Joe, there's 3,492 things, you know. There's one thing here. And he says, that one thing that nobody else recognizes that I do, if it isn't rectified, all of those other things will wither and your light will go. Your testimony will be gone. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee that thou hast left thy first love. Not lost. When something is lost, you don't know where it is. They've stepped away from it. They've abandoned it. They've left it. He doesn't say this church doesn't love him. What he says is there's a quality to that love that used to be there that isn't there anymore. There's a quality to it. It was first love. It was espousal love. It was engagement love. There was a thrill. There was an intensity. There was that carving a heart and your names on a tree love. You know, that was that goo goo I love. You know, you see a young couple come in the church. They're not husband and wife. They're bride and groom. You know, uh, I think as Dobson says, marriage is a three ring circus. It's the engagement ring, the wedding ring and the suffering. You know, <laughs> but you see, you know, when the Lord wants to talk about a relationship, this passion, he talks about a bride and groom, not the husband and a wife, because all of the things in life come that kind of be distracting. You see, I see them walk in sometimes. They got the same shirt on, you know. It's like, oh, cut me a break, you know. And you think that, you know, the guy's in love because he bought toothpaste, he bought deodorant, he bought, you know, the things you don't do after, you're, you know, after you settle in. Um, so the Lord says, look, there's, a, there's something missing. There's a fire. I didn't save you so you could be my employee, so you could be my servant. He'll say it to me, you know. I didn't hire you, Joe, big shot. I gave birth to you. You're my son. Pastor, that's a temporary thing. Ain't no pastors in heaven. I'll be on unemployment there. Pick up my guitar, maybe I'll get to be a worship leader again. <laughs> be great. They have those. You know, my kids, some of my kids work here at church, you know. If my son walks in my office or my daughter, I don't think, oh, the senior high guy, I wonder what he wants. I don't ever think that. It's the senior high guy. That's the graphics person. I think that's my son. Takes my breath away. That's my son. He's serving Christ. He's walking with him. I remember when he needed to get beat every day. <laughs> he's walking with the Lord, serving the Lord, effective. There's something about love in that context. You know, they say a house is not a home. That's because after you're married for a while, a home can become a house, right? It's just brick and mortar, it's gonna burn. Better to have a home with goo goo eyes than a mansion with lukewarmness. You know, most of us, my age at least, remember we were hippies, we had nothing. And uh, we fell in love, 
and had everything. We hadn't, didn't have nothing, but we, you know, you had that. Then, you know, you talked about the police, the man, we don't want the man needs to leave us alone. We want the man. And then you get married and you buy a house and a car. Then you want the police to protect your stuff. <laughs> it ain't, ain't the man anymore, you know. The, the life changes. And here Jesus is saying, you know, all of this stuff is great. I, I see it. I know it. I take note of it. I'm so glad that, that you know, you're, you're doing these things for me. Where's the relationship we had at the beginning? Where's the love, the quality of love that a bride and a groom has that we had at the beginning that kind of set everything on fire, put you in motion? Look, this is for all of us to think this morning. For me, we first got saved. That first love, David says, restored to be the joy of my salvation. Two particular prayers in the book of Ephesians. Paul prays for them to have more light, and he prays for them to have more love. Interesting. And here's this church at Ephesus. He's saying, I'm going to remove your light if your love isn't there where it should be. So it's a good, you know, thermometer for us to use. We should take our spiritual temperature. Is there a burning love? Do we still, look, I'm preaching to me. I'm not preaching to you. I, I think when I was first saved, I think it was, I didn't know the difference between an epistle and an apostle. I never even heard of the book of Galatians. All I know is Jesus died for me. Jesus shed his blood for me. He took me right out of drugs and right out of the world. I'm going to heaven now. He called me his son. You know, you, you, the, there's that shock and that amazement. And look, and the Bible says we love him because he first loved us, right? We love him because he first loved us. And when we first come, we got nothing but stains and wounds and, and, and we're dirty. And he takes us. And, and then what's, what's in front of us is his love. We love him because he first loved us. You know, it says in the book of Micah, chapter 7, 18, he says, he says, who is like unto thee, Lord, for giving mercy? You know, and you don't hold your anger. You just, you know, the, the, it speaks of his love. And Campbell Morgan says, that's because you and I see something every day that God can't see. We see something every day that God can't see. We see our equals. Miserable, unhappy, driving in their car with their coffee, trying to put on their makeup, texting, bumping into people. You know, we see our eagles. We're surrounded with them. They're gripey. They're complaining. They hold grudges. And he says, but there's none like you. Who is their Lord like unto thee? Which means his love is different than any other love. We don't deserve his love. We can never earn his love. He doesn't love us because we're lovable. He didn't say, oh, my goodness. I'm going to send my son down there to die for that one. They're so cute. <laughs> don't do that. We love him because he first loved us. And when we first get saved, we're amazed at that because we bring nothing to the table but a, a sinner. Somehow as we go on with the Lord and we serve and we, you know, then we get uh, defined in categories. Thing. Sometimes we think, well, I'm doing okay today. I'm doing this okay. And he's saying, well, that's going to run out of gas. Oh, you got all this great stuff going on. But what hurts me is, is we would spend time together. Joe, where are you? Early in the morning. Some mornings I wait for you and you never come. Where are you? I just want to be with you. When the dew is still on the roses, huh? It tells me that I am his own. The joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. And I say, sorry, Lord. Sorry, Lord. 
I'm not your employee, I'm your son, get so wrapped up with things. And he says here in verse 4, nevertheless, this is the one thing, one thing that outweighs all of the other many things that are good. They're going to run out of momentum without this one thing. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left, not lost, Thou hast left thy first love. And then he gives us a prescription. He tells us how to get back. He doesn't just say, I have this against you and leave you there. He says, here's a remedy. Now look, we're going to believe that this Ephesian church took this to heart because this is around the end of the first century. This Ephesian church, which is remarkable, goes on with notoriety into the, uh, into the fourth century. In, in 431, all the Eastern bishops of, of the Christian world came and met at Ephesus. Who by the fifth century had, had dried up in, the, in a short time. But evidently, that, and you think that's, a, that's amazing. That's eight, nine generations that there was still life there. So they must have taken these things to heart. He says, remember, this is what you need to do. Remember, and the older I get, the harder that becomes. Uh, my wife will say, what did I tell you? And I feel like I'm four again. Uh, you say that to your kids all the time, don't you? What did I tell you? Uh, you know, uh, you weren't listening. Yeah, I was. Uh, it's broken. Uh, I was listening. You know, remember, and this is called a present imperative. So it's not a suggestion, it's imperative. This is necessary. Present tense tells us this has to be a way of life. You must constantly remember. That's what he's saying. As anybody would say that to the person they're closest with and they love. You must constantly remember there from whence thou art fallen. This is a vertical problem, not a horizontal problem. From whence thou art fallen. It tells us in Ephesians, 30 years before this, chapter 2, verse 6, that they were seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You read the letter to the Ephesians and the most glorious things that Paul said to any of the churches, you'll find them in Ephesians. He says, remember from where you're fallen. There was that high, wonderful, holy place of fellowship that we had. It wasn't perfect in relative, in relative to your intellectual capacities, but it was perfect in relative to your heart. It was genuine love. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could serve him. He died on the cross to restore the fellowship that was lost in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. And Jesus died. He said, it is finished. The doorway was open again for fellowship. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom so that everyone could go and have fellowship with God again. And sometimes, you know, we're, we're like, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, may I have this. And, you know, it becomes, you know, the, the, the asking. And we should ask. And he tells us to ask. But that's not why. He doesn't want to only see us when we have a list of stuff we want. The reason his son died on the cross was to restore fellowship again. So he says, do this. You must constantly be remembering from where you are fallen. It just means saying, yeah, you're right. Take, you take your own inventory. Man, oh man, you're, he's right. When I was saved, I was just on fire. I didn't know nothing, but I, was, I drove people ran away from me when they saw me coming because they knew what they were going to hear. You know, remember from where thou art fallen. Then he says, and then as you remember that, repent and do the first work. Some say, you know, remember, repent, repeat, if you want, like ours. Um, repent means change the mind, change the direction, change metanoia, change the mind. You need to repent. You need to come back. You need to, this has to affect your thinking and your internal functioning. If you remember where you've fallen from and it's not there anymore, he doesn't say get lost. He says repent, come back. And then he says, and then do the first works. If the repentance is real and the love is there again, what were the things we did when we were first saved? I remember, you know, 
reading whole books of the Bible. I would sit down and read the whole book of James. I would read the whole book of Ephesians. It wasn't like, these are my daily devotions. You know, pull out a, a verse from the little bread thing on the table. I, I, was, I, I was eating it alive. I would sit down and re, just read a whole book. When was the last time you did that? How many people read ahead? You know, this is only seven verses, you know. Look, this is personal inventory. What were the first works? I would read whole books. And when I would read them, I would think, how do I obey? Okay, how do I do this now? It wasn't just information, it was doing. How do I do this? You do the first works. Tapes. In our day, children, we had these things called cassettes. Um, you can go to the History Museum and probably see one of those on display there. But I ate cassettes like grapes. I just went through cassette after cassette after cassette. I, I couldn't wait. I couldn't get enough. Fellowship. I love to be around other Christians. You know, somehow, the longer we go on the Lord, our love turns to discernment, right? We just used to come and love everybody. No, don't sit over there. Don't ask them how they're doing, you know, just, it, you know. There was that fellowship that was sweet. Singing. I didn't just sing in church. I sang when I was working. I was a carpenter. I remember driving 16 penny nails and I was singing. I was beating in time with the song as I was, you know, so you did, you, you just singing, you know, just it was something that went on. It's interesting because Paul tells the Ephesians in chapter five, they should be singing and making melody in their hearts. And then they should submit themselves to one another. This is what a wife does. This is what a husband does, goes through the whole description. And he says, this is a picture of Christ and the church. And here this Ephesian church is hearing it again, right from the lips of Jesus. Go back and do those first works again. What were my priorities then? Who did I hang out with? When you first got saved, who did you hang around with? Well, first of all, your unsaved friends didn't want to hang around with you because they thought you flipped your lid and they, they, or you've already heard it. Here we go. We're going to hear it again. I know you got to repent. You got to accept Jesus. You know, just, you know, who did you hang around with? You hung around with other Christians. Now, sometimes I see Christians, who are they hanging around with? Look who they're hanging around with. You know, my pastor always used to say, take a German shepherd, let him run with a pack of wolves. Do the wolves become domestic or does the German shepherd become wild? You know, yes, we're to be around our unsaved friends to share Christ with them, to evangelize. We're supposed to be there to infect them. They're not there to infect us. When we first got saved, who'd we hang with? Important questions. Are we going to take inventory? He says, remember, you must constantly, therefore, be remembering where you used to be, where you ain't no more where you've fallen from. And as you realize that, then repent, come back, turn around. My arms are open, repent, come back. And do what you used to do when you are first saved. Do the first works, he says. And he says, or else. Now, I didn't like it when my mom said that to me when I was growing up, you know. Uh, you know, or else. When Jesus says it, my ears kind of perk up, here we go, or else. He says, I will come unto thee and quickly and remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. Uh, twice he says to turn back. If you don't turn back, your light's going to go. You're going to lose your light. I'm going I'm to remove the lampstand. You know, you, you know, your church is doing great. It's growing. The good stuff is going on. The church is in love with Jesus, in love with the word, in love with the Holy Spirit. But as you get comfortable and things go on, you know, when you were a, you were a young uh, Christian, you were on fire. You wouldn't even look at a can of beer. Now you're 40 years old and you're letting your 19 year old, because he's almost 21, have keg parties in the house. You're letting things in your life that you would never let in your own life when you were back then. He says that kind of cooling in the church, what happens is, the, the lamps that the light of that church is removed and some church down the street starts over again with fresh revival and a fresh moving. I don't want them to remove the light that has been here that 
has shined through our church and the fellowships that have been born and the opportunities that we have and the, the privilege to gather and worship together and love one another. And you guys with me? Let's finish this together. Amen. Let's cross the finish line blazing. Okay. Not smoldering. <laughs> blazing. Let's cross the finish line blazing. So he says, he said, but you do have this going for you. Verse six. I like this. He says, this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So first time you hear from Jesus in the Bible, the only time that he literally hates a particular thing. So when he says that, your ears kind of go up. He hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, these are not people who stay up late at night watching TV. Those are Nickelodeons. <laughs> these are the Nicolaitans. And what is that? Some of the early church fathers said, well, that was the Bishop Nicole as mentioned in Acts chapter six and a movement started under him and he taught immorality and he let all of that go on and so forth. Uh, it's hard to substantiate that and you can't trace Nicole from the book of Acts to that doctrine. And he's already said, I appreciate the fact that you hate those that are evil and you don't put up with that. The other thing you do with the word here is Nikeo laity. It's made up of two words. Nikeo is Nike. If you have Nike sneakers on, that's the first half of the word. It means to conquer, to domineer, to be victorious. Nike. Laodin is laity. I think what Jesus is saying, and he says it again to the letter of Pergamos, I hate the domineering of the laity. I hate the veil menders. The, the veil was torn in the, in the temple from top to bottom so that every man had access to God. Now these stinking guys will come back in with their needle and thread trying to sew up the veil again. That doesn't help me when I want to be with my first love, Jesus says. I'm trying to call people back to me. Now I got some character saying he's a priest or an apostle or some title standing between me and my people. I hate it. I hate it. You know, I got kids. I don't want anybody coming to my kids saying, well, your dad really didn't want to see you today. Excuse me. <laughs> they were wrong kids, but don't ever act like me. You know, your love, your wife, your kids, the people closer to you where there's passion. Jesus says, I hate the Nicolaitans. They step in as representatives of me, putting themselves between me and my people who were paid for in my blood, not theirs. And when I died on the cross, I said, it is finished. I don't need no help from this character. No Nicolaitans. He said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You hate that too. That's good for both of us. Then he who has an ear to hear, okay? Let him hear what the Spirit is presently saying to the churches. That's not for me. That's for you and me. That's not for your wife or your kids. It's not for the person sitting next to you. It's not for your partner in ministry. It's not for your spouse. That's for you. He that has an ear, singular. Let him hear. Let him be hearing constantly what the Spirit is presently saying to the churches. Us this morning. We got to hear him saying to us, look, you can do all kinds of good stuff. And, and people look at it and say, that's great. Oh, I can't believe you're doing this. He said, but I'm the only one that understands there's something that's withering, unnoticed by anybody but me. And that, that's what drove you to these things was the love that we shared, the love we had one for another, that goo goo eye love. Where is it? You know, you love me. I understand. But where's the espousal? Where's the love of the bride and the groom? Where's the first love? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, overcometh is overcoming. Now that's not by your effort. It says, 1 John 5 says, we overcome the world by our faith, even by your faith. Revelation 12 is going to say they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Our overcoming is directly attached to our love and intimacy with him. And he says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat 
I always like that idea of eating. Give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He's going to give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's before the fellowship was broken. That's before Adam sinned. The tree of life shows up in Genesis 2, and it shows up in Revelation 22. The tree of life. Amazing, huh? In the midst of the paradise of God. And it's paradise to him because he's telling you he wants you there. He wants you eaten of that tree. He sees all your good stuff, but he has a warning for you. Brother, sister, mirror, he has a warning for you. You can be doing all kinds of good stuff. But what's driving it? Is your tank empty? What's burning inside? Do you still love Jesus? Are you still contagious? And if not, you know what? I'd never drive you away. Just remember the way it was. And repent. And get back to doing. Your repentance should have an expression. Get back to doing the things you did when, we were, when you were first saved. If you don't do that, your, your, your light's going to go out. I'll remove the lampstand. Your testimony will be gone. I'm glad you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I hate anybody coming between us because I'm after you for your first love again. Whoever's got an ear to hear, let them hear what I'm, what I'm saying to the churches today. He who overcomes, I'm going to let him partake and eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. That sounds good, doesn't it? Paradise? Not Jerry. I mean, just the whole idea. <laughs> paradise? Just think of what's ahead of us. When you watch the news, think of what's ahead of us. You know, as, as, we, as we finish with a, a particular song, Rob's going to come and sing this song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, written by Robert Robinson. O to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Written in 1758. Woman's riding in a stagecoach. And as she gets in, there's a man sitting across from her. And she starts to read that song. And she's reading the words out loud. And as she's reading it, the man sitting across from her breaks down and begins to weep. And she said, sir, I'm sorry, have I offended you? And he said, no. He said, I wrote those words. My name is Robert Robinson. And my heart has wandered, and I've been backslidden. And I'm so far away from him now. And I want him again to bind my heart to his courts above. Do you want that? Let's sing it together. Let's get Rob and the musicians. Let's sing this song together. Let's stand. If you're listening on the live feed or online and you want to ask Christ to be your savior, there's a number that'll come up on the screen. I encourage you to take advantage of that. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, look, we have lots of visitors now because they're coming saying, my church ain't open and we came here. We never heard anybody teach the Bible before. We're staying here. Well, if you, you, you can't just hear somebody teach the Bible. You need to turn to Jesus Christ and ask him for forgiveness and have that new birth. You need to be a born again Christian. And if you haven't done that after the service, come up. We want to pray with you. We'll give you a Bible, some literature. We're not going to take your email or your phone number or your home address or anything. We don't want anything from you. We want everything for you. So if you never made that decision, please come and see us after the service. Well, let's bow our hearts. Let's pray. And then let's sing this song to our first love. Lord, I know you've overheard. And uh, we set our hearts before you. And Lord Jesus, uh, you know, here I am, Lord, doing this passage a second time. Never let me be familiar with it, Lord. Let it... Rise off the page, Lord, and speak, Lord, to all of us. Lord, 
Jesus. And as you walk in the middle of the lampstands, the things you're longing for is a loving relationship. Lord, so many Christians feel like the, the, I have to give this up and I have to give that up and I have to give this. And somehow we can get to that place or we can forget what you want more than anything is our hearts. Our hearts, Lord. My heart, Lord. Lord, we believe these are the last days, Lord. Lord, we always want to be aware of where we've fallen from, even if we've only fallen yesterday, Lord. And we want to be quick to come back, Lord. Your prescription, Lord, and depend on your faithfulness then to bless. We put this before you, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Receive this song as a, as a sweet savor, as an offering before your throne.